Hi, in this presentation we're going to talk about rare earth element analysis by ICPMS. We're going to talk about the importance of rare earth elements, the problems with measuring rare earth elements using the ICPMS, how to deal with remove, interference removals, the Nexian features that help with this, and then we're going to move on to some applications. So rare earth elements have unique magnetic, luminescent and electrochemical properties. The purity of the rare earth elements will affect the final product performance. The challenges for measuring rare earth elements are they form oxides very easily and they have a low second ionization potential, so they can easily double charge. Rare earth elements are used in many different technologies from aerospace, healthcare, clean energy and electronics. Commonly used elements a lanthanum in cameras and telescope lenses, cerium in catalytic converters in cars, gadolinium for X-ray, MRI scanners, TV screens and fluorescent lamps, pyridisium for aircraft engines, high-powered magnets, terbium and europium in TV and computer screens and radars. So now, now let's talk about the problems with double charge formation from rare earth elements. As rare earth elements double charge very easily and the ICPMS measures a mass to charge ratio, when we double charge, we start causing problems further down the periodic table from gallium to strontium. As shown in this table on the right hand side, you can see um, that some of the double charges from rare earth elements will cause problems with, other with elements that are already difficult to measure, such as arsenic and selenium. To deal with this, we need to try and remove some interferences. The first thing we'll try and do is tune the instrument to reduce double charge formation, and then we'll start using reaction or collision cell gases to remove these interferences. Now let's talk about the problems when rare earth elements oxidize. Because rare earth elements oxidize easily, they start to cause problems with other rare earth elements and interferences, as you can see from the table on the right hand side. Again, to remove these interferences, we're going to want to start to reduce the oxide, oxide formations and use reaction or collision cell gases to remove the interferences. So interference removal. First of all, we need to try and tune the instrument to reduce double charges and oxide formation. And then there are three main ways in which we can start to remove the interferences using the instrument. Firstly, we have standard mode. In this mode, to remove interferences, we have to use correction equations. Some common correction equations can be seen on the right hand side um, in the table on the right hand side. A lot of the time we get acceptable detection limits with standard mode um, operation, but there can be errors if the matrices are high or we have high levels of interferences. The second way to remove interferences is by using kinetic energy discrimination, or KED. In this technique, helium is flowed into the universal cell. This helium causes collisions with the ions that travel through the system. The number of collisions causes an en energy loss. The larger atomic radii lose more energy than the smaller ones. This means it's good for removing polyatomic interferences. The downside is all elements will lose some energy, so you do lose some signal from your target element. The final way to remove interferences is by using a dynamic reaction. In this process, we'll flow a reaction gas, typically oxygen or ammonia, into the universal cell and either react away the interference or make, cause a reaction with the analyte of interest and cause a mass shift. In this process, we have minimal loss of analyte sensitivity and we get the best detection limit capabilities. The Nexian 2000 has many gas capabilities that help with interference removals. It comes with three gas channels, one of which can take 100% ammonia as a reaction gas, and the other two can use any other gases you require. Gases can also be mixed online within the cell if custom mixes are required for a specific application. The Nexian also comes with customizable profiles. With this, you can customize your QID for different profiles, or you can unlink certain conditions parameters. So 
So now we're going to talk about how to measure impurities in concentrated rare earth elements. The object of this investigation was to measure the capability of the ICPMS to accurately determine very low impurity levels in high purity rare earth element matrices. So the complications with the rare earth element matrices are they produce oxides and double charges very easily. We're going to use all three um, modes of operation, standard, collision mode with helium, reaction mode with ammonia and oxygen. The high matrix content of these samples means that we need to have a robust plasma. So we have to use energetic plasma conditions and we have to adjust the oxide ratio to be between to be 1.5% in standard mode and 0.1% in collision mode. So in the next in series ICPMSs have unique characteristics to help analyze high purity rare earth elements. We have three distinct modes for analytical use. The standard mode has high sensitivity for elements which have no interferences, and in this case we're going to use no correction equations. Collision mode is a simple solution for complex interferences at moderate levels, and the reaction mode has the ability to remove high levels of interference while increasing signal to noise results for the lowest possible detection limits. All three modes will be used for high purity REE measurements. So now let's look at a way to develop a method to remove double charges. In this example, we're going to use 1 ppm gadolinium. Gadolinium would normally have a mass range of between 152 to 160, depending on the isotope you chose to measure. This means that its double charges are going to be between 76 and 82. In the graph on the screen, you can see a scan of between 74 and 80. These mass scans were done in both standard mode, which is the blue line, and reaction mode, which is the red line. If we first focus on the blue line, this clearly shows the double charges effects from gadolinium. When adding a reaction gas, which in this case was ammonia, you can see on the red line that you get a re reduction of the gadolinium double charges. There still is a small hump at 80, which is due to argon 2. So now let's look at a way to develop a method for oxide removal. In this example, we're going to use terbium oxide on lithium. So two samples were made. One 10 ppm terbium and the other of 10 ppm terbium plus 10 ppb lithium. Let's focus on the graph on the screen. If you look on the left hand side, we're going to talk about counts per second, which please note are, is on a logarithmic scale against ammonia flow into the cell. Here, if you focus on the green line, you can see that with 10 ppm terbium only, um, as you increase the ammonia flow into the cell and you increase the amount of reaction occurring, the counts from the terbium decrease rapidly. Now let's focus on the blue line. The blue line is 10 ppm terbium plus 10 ppb lithium. In this case, as the ammonia flow is increased, there becomes a stage where the counts per second reduces much less rapidly. This is the point where you're getting rid of most of your terbium oxide interference and you're being left with lithium. We can have a look at the best BECs for lithium in terbium by looking at the red dotted line and then the scale on the right hand side. From this graph, we can now pick what our best ammonia flow and reaction conditions would be for measuring lithium in terbium. Now let's look at measuring impurities in high purity rare earth elements. For this study, we prepared individual solutions of rare earth elements at 10 ppm from 1000 ppm stocks. We then looked at elements that would be affected by either double charging or oxide interferences to find the best BECs in this study, no correction equations were used. Over the next few slides, we're going to talk about which modes will be better for which interferences, depending on what high purity rare earth element your matrix is. To help with this, we've color coordinated some of the boxes. So anything that's boxed with green will be in KAD mode. 
Anything with orange will be a DRC mode and anything in red will be a DRC mass shift mode. So let's start by looking at the impurities measured in 10 ppm lanthanum. In the table on the screen, you can see the best BECs were found on the right hand side. So let's start looking at the interferences from double charges. In this case, gallium and germanium have no interferences and can be used in standard mode. However, selenium is best measured in ammonia DRC, whilst arsenic is best measured with a um, mass shift using oxygen DRC mode. Moving on to look at the interferences from oxides, you can see in this case most of them can be measured in the standard mode. However, gadolinium needs to be measured in a collision mode and hafium in a DRC oxygen mode. In this case, all BECs were below 25 ppt and actually most of them were below 10 ppt. So how about other rare earth elements? So here we're going to look at measuring impurities in 10 ppm cerium. In this case, when you look at the interferences caused by double charging, you can see now that gallium needs to be used in a DRC oxygen mode and selenium and arsenic will be in a DRC oxygen mass shift mode. Moving on to the interferences from the oxides, in this case, you can see there's a good spread of either using a collision mode or standard mode to get the best BECs. This time, if you're measuring impurities in 10 ppm peridinium, you can see the interferences from the double charges. In this case, gallium is now going to be best measured in a DRC ammonia mode rather than an oxygen mode that was in the previous slide. However, again, selenium and arsenic are best mass shifted with a DRC oxygen mode. Again, the interferences from the oxides in this case will be a mixture between standard mode and collision mode. Measuring the impurities in 10 ppm europium, once again looking at the interferences from double charges, now you can see that gallium and germanium can be measured in standard mode, whereas selenium is now in a DRC ammonia mode, and once again arsenic is in a mass shift DRC oxygen mode. Interferences from the oxides again will mainly be a mixture of collision and standard mode depending on which element. Now if we start to look at measuring impurities in 10 ppm gadolinium, once again you can see the interferences from the double charges are similar to the last example, where gallium and germanium can be measured in standard mode, selenium in a DRC ammonia mode, and arsenic in a DRC oxygen mass shift mode. If you start looking at the interferences from the oxides, however, we're starting to have to use some DRC reaction modes, as well as collision modes and standard modes to get the best BECs for those elements. Now we're going to look at measuring the impurities in 10 ppm terbium. Once again, the interferences from the double charges are very similar to the last example. However, the interferences from the oxides are a mixture of standard DRC oxygen and collision mode. If you compare this to the last slide, you can see that different elements now need different modes to get the best BECs. So in summi summary, the Nexian ICPMS provides excellent interference removal in rare earth element matrices without the use of correction equations. However, you need to select the best analytical mode for impurity measurements, which is dependent on the rare earth element matrix. There is no one size fits all for these analysis, which is what makes it so complicated. In this case, a mixture of standard mode, collision mode with helium and reaction mode with either pure ammonia or oxygen was used. The BECs in all six rare earth element matrices evaluated here were less than 200 ppt, with most of them being below 10 ppt. So now we're going to move on and look at the accuracy of measuring rare earth elements in geochemical standards. For this study, eight samples were digested using lithium metaborate fusion. Following digestion, the samples were diluted a further 20 times for analysis by ICPMS. The samples were introduced to the ICPMS using Perkin-Elmer's new high throughput system, or HTS. The sample to sample time was 105 seconds. 
This consisted of a sample measurement time of 85 seconds, uptake and stabilization of 12 seconds, and a rinse time of 8 seconds. This, was equate, this equated to about 34 samples an hour. During this study, we also utilized the, AMS, the Nexian's capability to use an all-matrix solution, AMS dilution. This is available on all Nexian ICPMSs. This is an online argon dilution that occurs just before the sample enters the plasma. Because of the high TDS of these samples, we added a dilution of about 50 times. However, this dilution is applied to everything, including the calibration, CCV and CCBs, therefore does not need to be accounted for in the final concentration calculations. The stability of these samples was analysed for six hours and CCVs and CCBs were run every 16 samples. In this slide, you can see the CCB and CCV recoveries. CCV recoveries were between 80 and 120% for the entire six hour run, and CCB measurements were well below 0.1 ppb for the entire run. The limit of detection and accuracy of CRM materials was also measured for all rare earth elements. In the table at the top, you can see that the limit of detection was measured from a lithium metaboric blank and all detection limits were below 1 ppb, with most below 0.1 ppb. In the bottom table, you can see four CRM materials. These materials were measured throughout the six hour run of analysis, and the table shows the average recovery seen. From the table, you can see that all recoveries were between 90 and 110%. This shows good stability and robustness of the system, for these very high TDS matrices over the six hour period. So now we're going to look at the sample stability over time. In this slide, you can see samples one through four. You can quite clearly see for all samples that the recovery for all that rare earth elements was between 80 and 120% over the six hour run. Moving on to the next slide, you can see the same data for samples 5 through 8. Once again, you can see that we had good recovery from between 80 and 120% for all samples across all rare earth elements. In summary, lithium metaborate samples were run with just 20 times dilution over a six hour period. A further dilution was achieved using our online argon AMS dilution. This was used to reduce plasma loading for long-term stability and was applied to all standards, CCVs, CCBs and samples, so did not need to be accounted for in the final calculations. Detection limits were below 1 ppb for all rare earth elements. No carryover was observed using the Perkin-Elmer HTS introduction system and stability and robustness of the sample analysis was shown with the recoveries between plus or minus 20% for all samples, CCVs and CCBs over the six hour period. Thank you for listening and I'll take any questions.